On July 28, 2007, I had the opportunity to interview Major General Lucius Theus, U.S. Air Force retired. Originally a Tuskegee Airman, he was one of three African Americans to attain the rank of general. During this interview, he talked about his childhood, he talked about his movement through the ranks from an enlisted man to that of an officer, and he talked about some of the trials and tribulations that befell him along the way. I excerpted one of them and put it up on my channel where he was talking about his um, problems at Officer Candidate School. During that interview, he related the fact that one of the cadets that had agreed to move into his room with him was severely chastised by the upperclassmen and told to move out. Well, I received an email from that classman when he saw this excerpt, and I've since tried to contact him for a chance to interview him and find out what he thought about that whole situation. I've put this up on the net because I think it's time now for the full interview to be shown. Up until now, I've been trying to figure out how I could make it into sort of like an exciting program, but I can't do anything to make it any better than it is. And so with that, I introduce you to General Lucius Theus. I'm just delighted to be here at our family reunion. And uh, DJ, it's just a real pleasure meeting you and having the opportunity to talk with you on this recording. So looking forward to telling you a little bit about my background. And uh, I would certainly encourage you to interrupt me at any time and ask me to expand on an item or say that perhaps we ought to move to another subject. Let me just tell you a little bit about my background. My, and when I say my background, I'm thinking in terms of my background from the very beginning. I was born in Madison County, Tennessee, so far out from the cities that there was no city recorded on my uh, delayed birth certificate. It shows simply Madison County. Uh, my father was a common laborer and a part-time minister, and he decided that he would follow the classic migration of African Americans from the south to the north. And so he took the entire family, moved us from Tennessee to Chicago, Illinois. He found much the same as many of the other African Americans who migrated north, that the streets and the cities were not covered with gold as they thought they were. And so you had to get out and hustle, earn a living, and find a place to live. So he, along with a number of other African Americans, went out to this little area called Robbins, Illinois, a little town that was all African American except for two white families, two merchants who lived out there. And they collaborated with one another to build homes. And so I grew up in this small town uh, on the outskirts of Chicago. The town was so small that we didn't have a high school, so we had to be bused to an adjacent town, Blue Island, Illinois, for high school, and I'll talk more about that. But what happened is that, uh, as with a number of youngsters at that time, I uh, became very interested in aviation. I used to read the comic books to see about see Mandrake and the Magicians, uh, G8 and the Flying Aces. And also, as it turned out, this was the era, the era of the explosion of aviation. I saw the birth of commercial aviation, the birth of uh, stunt flying, uh, and uh, just demonstration flying, and a number of African Americans wanted to learn to fly. They became very interested in aviation. The problem was that they were not welcomed at many of the airports in the area. But again, the news was full of aviation. Particularly, we, as we read about and heard on the radio, 
about the screaming German Stuka dive bombers softening up the Allied lines in Europe uh, for the lightning thrusts of the German panzer divisions, the tank divisions. It was an era in which aviation was paramount. These young African Americans did not have a way to fly from the majority airfields, and so they made arrangements with farmers, farmers near the little town where we grew up, Robbins, Illinois, and they had a dirt strip there where they would come out, land their aircraft. We would see them there uh, in their leather jackets, jackets, their helmets, their leggings, and all of that. And what and with it, what we thought were very sleek flying machines, they would come and land those aircraft out there, strut around them, look at them, and we kids in the eight, nine, ten year old bracket would go out, admire them, and uh, say, of course, worked on their aircraft and that sort of thing. And if we were good kids, they would let us get close enough that we could feel and touch these airplanes. And then, if we were very good kids, frequently these aviators would give us a ride in their airplanes. They would take us up, fly us around the area, and so forth, and land. And so that's the way I really became interested in aviation. I was bound to determine that I was going to have a career in aviation of some kind. In fact, I felt so strongly about this that I decided that I was going to build myself an airplane. The problem is, of course, I knew nothing about aeronautics. I knew nothing about what made airplanes fly and all of that, but I was bound and determined to build one. So I did. I put, took some of the uh, wire from uh, coat hangers, made a frame, a fuselage, if you want to call it that, and that's what it was. Uh, took some of my mother's old sheets to use those as the covering for this aircraft. I thought that, um, that airplanes flew by having a propeller and a motor, so I took a uh, clock, an old clock, and got that thing squared away so that when I'd pull a string, I removed the little clicker so that I, when I pulled the string, it would spin this six inch, six inch propeller then I had this put on top of the coal shed and invited all of my young friends over to watch Luthias fly his uh, newly constructed airplane. Well, understandably, I got them together. I asked them to push me off of this coal shed. Uh, you can see that it flew just directly down to the, uh, uh, to the ground. Fortunately, I was not injured. But I loved what I was doing, and I knew again that I was going to be an aviator, whether it was actually flying, whether it was in the support area, or what have you, but my destiny was to be an aviator. So then, these young aviators that I mentioned, uh, and a number of other African Americans at that time, wanted to fly, but they had a prohibition on having African Americans fly military aircraft. So you could apply for it and wait, and of course nothing would happen. Then they announced the, uh, the program of aviation cadets for uh, African Americans, the formation of what was now, what is now known as Tuskegee Airmen. In those days we were simply colored aviators, or black aviators, and so uh, I was married very early. I got together with my wife one evening and I said to her, I said, "Hun, I really want to fly and you know that I want to fly. I said, and I only have $19. I'm going to use this $19 to buy a book on aviation, uh, aeronautics, learn everything that I can so that I'll be sure to be able to pass the tests. I did that. I went down to the old post office building in Chicago, took the examinations, and um, because of the studying that I had done, uh, this will sound a little boastful, 
but you still have to understand that I was determined to be an aviator. So I took the exam. The person administering the exam, upon scoring it, came out and he came to me and he said, young man, you said that you are not a licensed pilot. And I said, that's right, sir. And he said, he said that you've never flown an airplane. And I said, that's correct. He said, well, I just find it so unusual that uh, you have made one of the highest scores on this test for aviation cadet training that we've seen. And so it's hard to believe that you are not already a qualified pilot. And I assured him that I was not. Well, anyhow, he looked at those and he said, well, you've passed all of the tests. You've done very well for yourself. He said, the, uh, the only problem, you have a little bit of a problem with one of your eyes, and you'll have to get that checked out. He said, but go see an optometrist and then come back to see us. I did that. The optometrist said, you had to be just uh, overly tired and so forth because your eyes seem all right. He said, so eat a lot of carrots, rest up for a week, and then go back, and I'm sure that you'll be able to get through the test. And this was true. So I passed the test completely, physical and all, and I said to him then, now I'm ready to go and join this aviation cadet program. And I said, where do I go? He said, oh, now wait a minute, boy. He said, we're, we're building a, uh, an air base where we're going to teach you how to fly. And he said, that'll be a while before this happens. And I said, very good, sir, I'll wait. In the meantime, the draft board continued to breathe down my neck. I finally decided that since it was obvious that they didn't believe me, that I was going to go ahead into the Army Air Corps. So I said, go ahead, send me my papers, and I'll go into the Army Air Corps, and uh, I'll await the arrival of my papers and so forth to do that. So I did. Um, I was enlisted, uh, went down to, to uh, uh, an air base nearby uh, there to, uh, to be inducted into the, into the armed forces. And at that time, I let it be known again that I wanted to be in the aviation side of things. They said, well, we don't really care in wh where you go as long as you get into the service. And so they stamped. Army Air Corps on the back of my hands and uh, told me to go ahead. So I went down to Keesler Field, Biloxi, Mississippi. Quite an experience for a northern boy to go down there. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, I really fell in love with, with the Army Air Corps lifestyle. So I started to uh, work real hard. Uh, my commander noted me. They sent me off to a clerical school while waiting, still waiting for these papers to come through. I went to the clerical school, uh, again, uh, did very well, came back, worked very hard. Before I knew it, I had, I had picked up an additional stripe, uh, worked har even harder at it. Before I knew it again, I was a staff sergeant, acting first sergeant. Uh, then got word that my papers had come through, uh, but my captain, who uh, was a southern gentleman, but I thought a very fair person, he came to me and he said, Sergeant, he said, you, uh, uh, you've done so well here. He said, I want you to remain as my first sergeant. We need to do more work on the, on the squadron, and you're the ideal person to do that. And if you'll sign a delay, just ask for a delay that once we get the squadron in shape, that I'll see to it that you get into the program and get over to Tuskegee and go to flying. I agreed to that. Uh, and a year later, we, the squadron was in fine shape. Again, I hate to be boastful, but that's the way the world, world is. Uh, I went back to... Captain Weeks at that time, and I said, now, I said, sir, I think that we have everything well. We're winning the awards. The squadron is in good shape. Uh, and you said that once we did that, you would release me to go into the aviation cadet program. 
So he said, yes, he said, true to my word, I will. He said, go down to personnel, tell them that you are now ready to go into the cadet program. I did. They said then that, uh, well, young man, you're fully qualified, we have your papers here, but the program is being phased down. We're no longer taking volunteers for the program. We have all that we need, and so you'll have to uh, wait your turn and get into something else. I went back to my captain and told him how disappointed I was that he had interrupted my career uh, advancement, and he too was very regretful. But he said that uh, I really thought that I was going to be able to get you into the program, otherwise I would not have done this. And he said, so since, uh, since you are not going to go to aviation cadets, if you uh, apply for officer candidate school, he said, I'll certainly endorse your application and I'm sure that you'll be accepted. So I went to, uh, to the officer candidate school at, uh, at uh, Montgomery, Alabama at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base. The school was there for a very short period. I went there. There were, there were no other African Americans in, the, uh, in this class. Um, so I liked it very much. Uh, worked real hard at it. The um, first two times that we, they published the grades, uh, the person heading the list as the, the highest scoring individual in the class was Luthius. I did that for three consecutive periods. The class was, were, it was, there were four months duration. However, for some reason or other, when the uh, when we published the when they published the uh, final scores, I wound up as second from the top of my class. I did not understand that because I felt that whatever scores I made in my last uh, uh, quarter of the class would not be enough to offset the fact that I had been number one in the classes before that. Uh, however, I said, well. That's probably the way it is. Maybe I did slip a little bit, and so I'll uh, accept that. I learned later, and this, first of all, I did graduate second in my class uh, from Officer Candidate School, again using my old principle of exceeding expectations. I know that I was not expected to, uh, uh, to do too well. But I'll tell you a little side story about that, too. When we arrived at Officer Candidate School, the, um, the tactical officer who briefed us said that uh, you young men are fortunate to be here. Well, I don't see anything wrong with any of your records. There's no pr problem. We're sure that all of you will probably graduate. But in the meantime, you have to uh, determine how you're going to be bunked, where you're going to sleep go find yourselves a room. You can bunk wherever you want. So again, not being misled by these kinds of words, I uh, found the six-man room, went to that room, went in, made down my bed. Uh, we had our bed rolls and so forth, made down my bed and was in this room. And along came a young fellow from, uh, from Mississippi, as a matter of fact. He stuck his head in and he said, Lou, what are you doing in here by yourself? And I said, well, you know, the captain told us we could uh, choose a place to stay. And so since I didn't know anyone, I took this room. He said, well, I'll move in with you. So he went and got his bedroll and came down and made it down. And he said, my buddy will come along with me. So he did that. Uh, I'd say less than an hour after they had gotten bedded down, a tactical officer walked by, and when he looked at the room and saw these two Caucasian fellows in there with me, he skidded to a halt, turned sharply, came marching into the room. Of course, all of us immediately popped to attention. Uh, he ignored me completely. He went over to these fellows, and he chewed them both out. He said, you know better. You're from the South. You know you're not going to sleep in the same room with him. Emphasis on him. 
uh, and uh, went on to say that if they didn't move out that they would probably not get out of the school. So they both very reluctantly moved out of the, uh, out of the room. And uh, so I had the six-man uh, room to myself for two, two class sessions. And then finally, uh, in the next class, next to the last class, uh, an African-American fellow from, uh, uh, from Baltimore mo was moved in with me. And we had that quite a joke around the campus was that I had my own pleb, you know, my, my undergraduate person, so that when I wanted to brace someone or give them a bad time, I could simply march this fellow over to my side of the room, chew him out, and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, proceed with my, my work. But I was very happy to be able to graduate second in my, uh, in my class. Ah, that was good. I would say that I'm very blessed to have a wife who uh, was in my corner from the absolute very beginning. We were childhood sweethearts. We, um, we came along together, got married very early, and throughout all of the things that I did, she was right there, right there on my side, supporting me and doing anything that she needed to do to make sure that my career uh, was a su successful career. Uh, example, during the time I mentioned, uh, during the time I was working on my MBA, I would have her, I would give her cards with uh, topics, specific things in which I was interested, and she would go to the Library of Congress and dig out the information and so forth on, in various subjects and so forth, on various subjects. And so, uh, and then she would, uh, I said, I would have, after staying up all night studying, she was down there typing my term paper, you see? So this is the sort of, uh, sort of cooperation that I had out of her. Team, uh, ab absolutely right there in my corner. So, uh, so that contributed an awful lot to it. In, in the meantime, we were assigned to a number of places where we had, uh, uh, where I know that we were under very close scrutiny. Uh, she was such a good mate, if you will, that she did her work in, in helping, to, uh, helping to advise the, uh, the young wives, keeping them pointed in the right direction as I moved up the, up the line and so forth, uh, that this met with a lot of commendatory comments and so forth. Uh, but anyhow, I went on and I found myself uh, uh, at, this, at a big air base at, uh, at uh, Chateauroux, France. Uh, all of the logistics for the European area. I was working for a fellow uh, by the name of Talmadge Cooper, uh, who for some reason or other took a liking to me and the work that I was doing. And uh, we had to set up a separate office in Athens, Greece, to be supportive of the Allied, uh, uh, Allied uh, military in that area and of course of the American forces in that area for unusual requirements. This meant that if we needed to put a thousand rifles of non-American manufacture at a given place at a given time, there was no question we, we, that's exactly uh, what we did. Um, I worked for this fellow, Cooper, who trusted me explicitly. And when someone trusts you explicitly, then it gives you the incentive and in fact the obligation to make sure that they haven't misplaced their trust. So he knew that if he turned a, a particular problem over to me that I would work that problem until I got the doggone thing solved. And it was during that time uh, where we were assigned, when we were assigned to, uh, to Greece that um, all in the meantime, I did, I knew that I had to have the advanced service schools if I were going to advance. So I hinted around, hinted around about uh, the Air War College and nothing happened, nothing happened. So I decided to take the Air War College by correspondence. Fortunately, I was able to graduate as a distinguished graduate from the, that class. Uh, I was asked then where did, should they send the information, the record, 
that I had, uh, had become a distinguished graduate, and uh, I was being very bold. I said, send it to the chief of staff of the Air Force. So they did. And so it came down the line with appropriate endorsements and so forth. Before I knew it, I was on orders to go to the, uh, to the Air War College on, on campus. And so that worked out very well indeed. Um, the, uh, just before that, I was sent to the Armed Forces Staff College, a joint, joint uh, college for uh, people moving up the line. You did have to have joint service duty if you were going to advance. Uh, I was in Greece and uh, didn't expect it. Came down through channels, a note that I had been selected for this school, and so Gladys and I were transferred back to the back to the U.S. to take, to do that. Uh, so, those are the kinds of good things that happen to you if you continue to uh, work hard. Uh, as for as for Colonel Cooper, we were going to set up this office in Greece. Uh, he asked me to do some special things of setting up the teletype equipment and. Uh, setting up the uh, the computer operation that we needed to do down there, I did, and uh, then we got back, came back, and I said, uh, uh, Colonel, you had me do a special job for you. I hope it was satisfactory. I would like nothing more than to continue to work for you, because he, he was on his way down there to be the commander of this special unit, and he said, Well, he didn't have anything that I could do, so he wouldn't 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 give me an assignment. But the night that uh, we were having our Christmas party, he came by my desk and said, uh, Lou, you said you wanted to continue working for me. And I, as you know, I'm transferring to Greece. And I said, I know that, sir. I said, but you said you couldn't use me down there. He said, oh, he said, don't think about that anymore. Tell Gladys that we're picking up her furniture day after tomorrow, and we're going to airlift uh, her furniture to Greece. So, <laughs> so. So this was the, these were the sort of things that, that worked so well for us. Uh, he was a fine gentleman, and I enjoyed working for him. Hard driving, but, uh, but really good. And let me tell you about uh, a little bit more. When I came back to the, uh, to the Pentagon, uh, I'd, well, before I got back to the Pentagon, we have to talk about uh, the Air War College. I uh, went to assignments and uh, talked to the people there, and I said, as you know, uh, I'm enjoying being in the Washington area, and I would like to come back to the Pentagon after I get out of Air War College. Um, they said, okay, well, we're going to work this for you. We'll, we'll get you back here. Uh, but when the detailer came down to pass out assignments, he went to everyone in the class before he came to me. He went to everyone in the class, and every time I would get try to get his eye, he would turn away and break off the uh, break off the contact. And so I should have known then that things were not as I had hoped. But he finally came over to me, and he said, "You know, I uh, I was watching you, and you were watching me. I know you thought that I was ignoring you." He said, "I had a hard time doing it because I have good news and bad news." He said, "We have a good assignment for you." He said, but it's not in the Pentagon, it's at Camera Bay. And I thought he was saying Cameron Station, which is a little station right inside of the Washington, D.C. area. And I said, oh, well, that's all right. You know, golly, that's good. I was look we were looking at houses in that general area. And he said, yeah, he said, but you didn't quite understand me. He said, I mean, Cameron Bay, South Vietnam. <laughs> I said, oh, so anyhow, <laughs> anyhow. Um, I said, is it my turn to go? And he said, no, not really. And I said, well, that being the case, why is it that I'm going to be placed on orders to go to Camera Bay rather than back to the Pentagon area? He said, well, he said, on the side, I'll tell you. He said, uh, you have a very impressive record. And he said, it was, it's really good. He said, the only problem is that we see that you haven't been in a combat zone in a long time. And so he said, uh, uh, you should really have some combat experience uh, if you're going to continue to advance. He said, you're on a fast track, and so forth. 
And I said, well, I said, well, is it my turn? And he said, no, he said, it's not your turn. He said, but you should get some combat experience. You should be in the combat area. And so I said, okay. He said, are you a volunteer? And I said, no, I'm not a volunteer. So he said, well, I said, if I don't volunteer, I said, what uh, happened then? He said, oh, we're going to send you anyhow. So I said, well, I, I volunteer. So I went to Vietnam as a volunteer. I was a controller of our largest base in, up there. And uh, uh, Camera Bay, as you know, was a, a major center, received all of the supplies and troops. And we flew F-4s out of there. And it was really quite, a, quite an operation. So um, I, I, enjoyed the, I enjoyed the assignment. It was a great assignment, as I said. And I was the, uh, the uh, commander of the base. So it uh, worked out very, very well indeed. Um, Again, even though I wasn't happy about being assigned to Camera Bay, I kept in mind that you have to exceed expectations. So I worked very hard at it. We did a lot of things, a lot of unique things that had to be done. And uh, then I came back to the Pentagon, and I was working for a hard-driving two-star. I was a colonel at the time. He was a very hard driver. Um, he would call up and ask the secretary to send me down. I'd go down and give, render the proper uh, courtesies to him, the salute and so forth. And, uh, and I would say, uh, the general sent for me, sir. And he said, you know, if, if the so-and-so general hadn't sent for you, what in the so-and-so are you doing in my office? And that was the way he talked. Uh, but he would give me a rough time at that time, but very interestingly, I would see him at the club that evening, and he would see my wife with me and so forth. He was just as affectionate and as courteous as you could, uh, could want anyone to be. And then he'd step over to me and put his arm on my shoulder and say, you know, I sure gave you a rough time today, didn't I? And I said, well, yes, sir, you did. He said, well, he said, but you're measuring up to it fine. He said, so keep doing the job. And that's the way that went. Uh, one day, one day, after working for him for quite a while, I concluded that, uh, that he didn't like me. And I, so I was going to take steps to get out from under him. And um, that day, the day that I made that decision, he called down there and uh, called my office and said, uh, send Colonel Theus down to see me. So I went down, and he gave me the usual routine. If I hadn't sent for you, what are you doing in my office, you know, and so forth. And then he said, you know, he said, we've, uh, we've been watching you for a long time. He said, Pete and I, Pete was the three-star controller of the Air Force at that time. He said, we've had our eye on you for a long time. And this time I decided to take the chance. And so I said, sir, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> so, so then he said, what are you, some kind of smart <laughs> or something? Well, anyhow, he said, well, he said, we really decided that you, it's time for you to have a new assignment. And I said to myself, oh, golly, I've had it. I'm being fired, you know what I'm saying? He said, but uh, we've got this assignment for you. He said, go down and Pete will tell you about it. This is uh, General Crow." I went down to see him, and he said, uh, uh, I want you to go upstairs and tell uh, uh, whatever the other guy's name, Schaefer, Pete Schaefer, tell him that you're his replacement. And I said, sir, are you referring to General Schaefer? And he said, yeah. I said, so I said, you go up, you tell him that I sent you up, you're his replacement. So I went up to see him, and uh, still stricken with courtesy that one has to render senior officers. I rendered a salute and everything. He said, oh, he said, I've been expecting you for a while. He said, we've been talking about you. And he said, uh, I'm retiring at the end of the month. He said, the job is yours. Uh, does the desk sit down, try it on for size. If you need me, I'll be on the golf course or at home. And let me know if you need any help, and I'll sure be happy to tell you anything else that you need to know about it. But you've been in this operation for so long, I'm sure that you know what the job is. So uh, 
Sure enough, I sat down there, and uh, less than six months later, the uh, the list of those promoted to Brigadier General came out, and my name was right on the list. So that's the way I got promoted to Brigadier General. That's the, the circumstances, of course, the way it, uh, way, it uh, way it happened. So I thought that was we'd be interested to know that. So my point is uh, the reason for telling you that is that uh, since you say that you're going to uh, have this available for young people is to caution them to not uh, be easily offended to the point that they would do anything rash because someone uh, is not all apple pie and all sweet and so forth to them. Uh, do the job well, exceed expectations, don't let any extraneous things detract you from doing exactly that, doing the job well and getting it done. So uh, I say to them, don't, uh, uh, don't uh, be distracted by someone who might not uh, be all sweet apple pie and so forth down the line. People have different ways of managing. And uh, and this guy was just a fellow who managed in a, in a rough uh, rough manner. So Basically, keep your eyes on the prize. Exactly, keep, and you hit. That's exactly purpose. what it is. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't let anything distract you from keeping your eyes on the prize. That's a good good way to put it. So I just thought you'd be interested in uh, in hearing that uh, that particular thing. Uh, we wondered if some things were not uh, not up at the time. Um, there was an assistant. There was an assistant uh, secretary of the Air Force who asked me to accompany him on a couple of trips. I did, and uh, so he became uh, so. Um, well, I should say he liked what I did on for from on the trips and so forth. And so when he was going to make these trips around the world, various places, Far East, sometimes to Europe only and so forth, he would send a little note down to the controller. And he said, I, as you know, I'm on my way to the Far East, and I wonder if Colonel Theus would be available to travel with me. Of course, the, the, um, the general there would immediately write back a note, sir, that if you want General Theus to be available to travel with you, I'm sure that he'll be available to travel uh, with you on that. And, and this was not a case of, uh, of doing any, uh, anything, oh, uh, shall we say, um, well, I, I won't use those terms here, but uh, of being uh, subservient or anything, but it was a matter of trying to anticipate what was required and doing the job, uh, doing the job well, and so that's why he wanted me to go with him. And as a result of that, there's no question in my mind that that played a big part in my being advanced to the rank of general. Now, then, when you look at this overall thing, we had, we had about uh, uh, almost a thousand young men who graduated from the pilot training and became pilots in, in Tuskegee Airmen. But for every other person, every one of those, we had at least 12 to 13 support persons. So we're talking about roughly 13,000 13, people. Of those 13,000 people, there were three became general officers. General Daniel Chappie James, who of course became our first American uh, black four-star. General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., who led us during the war. And yours truly, General Lou Theus. Um, you should also know that upon my returning from, from Vietnam, that um, we were the Armed Forces, not just the Air Force, uh, was uh, uh, rife with uh, social problems, discrimination. As you know, um, the President signed a complete in an integration order back in 1948 
In addition to that, there were, were various and sundry little papers put out about uh, treating everyone right and so forth. Uh, however, it was also the height of the civil rights movement in the uh, civilian side of things. And uh, there was some violence and all of that, as you know, from having been there yourself. And um, the armed forces became concerned about, one, whether there was a possibility that uh, the strife could, could and would spill over into the armed forces and therefore preclude our being ready and capable of performing our duty of defending the nation, number one. And uh, number two, that if that were possible and probable, what can and should we do about this problem? So the Secretary of Defense decided to uh, establish a committee to study this problem and uh, come up with these kinds of answers. One, is there a possibility, a probability, that it could spill over into the armed forces? And secondly, if so, what can and should we do about this to prevent it? Uh, I was asked to chair that committee. Um, I did not like the idea of chairing the committee because I knew that I was already on a fast track. Number one, I was in the positions that I had in the armed forces to, uh, to move up and so forth. So I hesitated about it. In fact, I even told them that I didn't like the idea of taking the job. Um, but I was told also that we have looked around the Air Force. We feel that you are the best person to chair this, this committee. And so I said, well, I'll make a bargain with you if I can, if I'm in a position to bargain. And I said, I don't know whether I am or not, but I asked uh, if you would do this. I know that I'm being carefully observed, um, and I don't want anything to interfere with that. I know that this job needs to be done. And since you've determined that I am going to do that job, why don't you let me do both jobs? I will continue in my current position. I will also take the responsibility for the second job. And if I fail in either one of these jobs, and if I'm fired, I will not complain. You will not hear from me on that subject. Everybody said, you know, we'll do it, but you're crazy. That, you know, do say that you're going to do both of these jobs and do both of them well. You're already working at top speed on this job. I said, I said the bar a bargain is a bargain. I said, I'll, I'll do both jobs, and if I fail, and you fire me, I will have no further comment. I will go in peace. So I worked on that. Um, Gladys will tell you. I spent sometimes at home, I would spend three or four hours about all the time that she would see me uh, on this whole job. I would come and go into the office, work on my job there, and then go, go take the little shuttle bus over to the uh, to Arlington where I had the special office to do this, uh, the special job. We interviewed individuals, we in, uh, in, individual service people. We interviewed, uh, a, had a lot of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists from the civilian society to come in and talk to us. We worked real hard at this thing. I had about a dozen people on my committee. Um, but my, uh, my deputy was a white uh, naval captain, and uh, then I had a mixture, very heterogeneous mixture of individuals on this uh, committee. And we concluded that, and, we, and this is what we reported to the Secretary of Defense, that yes, there's a definite possibility, not only a possibility, but a probability that this will spill over into the armed forces. And number two, that we need to do something about this urgently, right now. 
what do we need to do? We said that we needed to develop a program of education and race relations because there were too many people in the armed forces who did not know about the contributions of minorities and majorities in the building of our nation and their achievements not only in the armed forces but in our civilian sector. And we felt that if people knew about these contributions that this would, uh, would certainly affect their thinking about each other. And how are we going to do this? We felt that we needed to have, first of all, an institute to uh, develop plans and policies and to collect information on race relations, human relations in the armed forces. We needed an institution to train individuals and then to train instructors in, uh, in race relations. And uh, we needed to get the top level of people from the country to do this, not just people in the armed forces, but we needed armed forces representatives. We needed to demand that this course of race relations be given to every member in the armed forces, regardless of rank, throughout. And, uh, and again, we needed this institute, uh, which was bought, the whole program was bought. Uh, they asked us to come up with some rough ideas of a curriculum, which we did, and so forth. And we, they, we established the Race Relations Institute, DRRI, and, uh, which was later changed to be the uh, uh, Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute because we expanded it to, uh, to cover all aspects of this. We also demanded that uh, the performance reports of uh, supervisors indicate the progress that they had made in establishing and maintaining good race relations in their organizations and that there was a mandatory checkbox to be added to the checkboxes on the, on the, uh, in these reports. Sec the Secretary of Defense bought this whole plan, and so they did that. Uh, the Defense Race Relations Institute, and the, uh, which later became the Defense Equal Opportunity Ma Management Institute, became such an authority in this field that uh, that it provided advice and counsel to people in other countries, other nations. It's known as an authority. And as for Luthias, um, they, uh, they named the, um, the auditorium in this thing, the Major General Lucius Theus Auditorium. And that still exists. And as you know, the Institute is located at Patrick Air Force Base, Florida. And so uh, then when they built the new Institute, they rededicated the, uh, uh, the, the new auditorium as the Major General Lucius Theus Auditorium. I thought you might be interested to know that. But all in all, I, I enjoyed talking with you, and uh, hopefully it'll uh, inspire some other young people to, to succeed. I'm sure it will. That's what you really have to do. All they have to do is take the time. Yeah, exactly. Take the time and work at it. That's right. Work at it. you got to do it. The success is there. You can have it if you want. If you're willing to exceed expectations, and it doesn't matter what, what anyone else says about it, you have to be satisfied within yourself that you exceeded what you know they expected of you. Yeah, true. General Theus, thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure indeed, I'll tell you. So thank you so much.